that time again. Welcome back everybody. It's boot camp training. Can you believe it? We're up to video number nine, module number nine. Um, there has been a lot of content to cover of you as you have already uh, you've already been a witness to that. Um, we do have a, a, a bit bit to go and and uh, my plan is to um, give you everything obviously. Uh, to make you as successful as possible. Um, please go through that manual. I'm going to go ahead and get started. You know the ropes. You've been here long enough. Again, we're at number nine. And I thank you for coming back over and over again to check out the content. I, as I had promised in the beginning, some of it does repeat because it is mission critical for you to get it. Where did we leave off last time? Uh, we were talking about Oh, we were talking about a lot of things. Oh, um, was it Hess N, right? Um, send sick employees home now, which is hepatitis A, E. coli, salmonella, shigella, and norovirus. Awesome. Okay, so what I want to go on to and take you now is to, we visited it before. Um, again, we're going to be here because it is high risk populations and what we're talking about is the types of food whoops is the types of food that that you want to um address right or avoid okay and we talked about um so we're talking about high risk aka at risk um groups of the population Right? Uh, the population. So last time, we might have mentioned them all, but we were talking about children. I know I mentioned um, children's menus, right? We need to talk about the elderly. Whoops. Elderly. We have folks that are already sick, right? Their immune system is compromised, and one that comes comes and goes on the program is pregnant women and their unborn child, aka fetus. Right. So it's important to know the types of. Um, see, I'm Puerto Rican and Cuban, right? So one of the things that I don't, I'm not familiar with, is what was or what is now, I mean, I know it now, right, but, but when you talk about avoiding certain foods, you talk about avoiding poached eggs, right, you talk about avoiding eggs benedict, right, so those just don't exist, right? So what this is for me, now I know what they are, right? Some of you may know also. And the other thing is when I work with um, my classroom kids between the ages of 14 and 19, they're not, they don't have a, a rich menu to refer to, right? But these are the ones that you want to avoid with this population, right? Why? Because they are not, they are not well done. Right, so you want stuff that is well done. Specifically, what you also want, what you do want. So you want stuff that is well done, and you also want to make sure that it is pasteurized. Right, so you don't want to, you want to, you want to substitute um, pasteurized eggs for raw eggs. You get it? Um, or you may even go with um, powdered eggs. If you've ever had powdered eggs, um, I don't know. I can't tell the difference. Maybe you can. Except when it's sunny side up, right? A powdered egg is kind of like, eh, what in the world is that? So you also want to avoid, um, in the, in the, I'm going to put it in red, right? You want to avoid undercooked or raw um, meat products, right? Beef. Um, hamburgers, steak, stuff like that. You also want to avoid um, raw seeds and sprouts, right? So that's a that's a list of 
things you want to avoid. The other thing is also, so you want not only the eggs to be pasteurized, what else do you want pasteurized? Right? You want milk that's been pasteurized. You want eggs that are pasteurized. If you must work with honey, you can also get honey that is pasteurized. So there's a host of products that are pasteurized. And we talked about pasteurization in one of the earlier videos. And we said that it's, um, it's UHT, ultra high treated food products. So those are some of the things that you want to consider when you work with the at risk or, or high risk populations. All right. Uh, okay, that's about it for that area. I'm going to go, what I'm going to do is at some point when we get done with my, my laundry list of items that I want to cover, I am going to jump on the, um, the e-study guide. Okay, and I'm going to refer you to a specific page in there. And, and I keep reiterating how important it is that you go ahead and take advantage of this time to educate yourself on the 26 pages of content that are there so that you can help yourself. Okay, so you can help yourself for the, uh, for the test and also for the food safety component that is required on the field. Okay. The other thing I want to shift gears into right now is, I already covered that. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about imminent health hazards. Right. So what we're talking about with this, and did I spell that correctly? I always check my spelling because I hate to look bad. Uh, 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 imminent, imminent. Yep, okay, great. I spelled it right. Um, <laughs> so, imminent health hazards. We are talking about situations in your restaurant, right? Situations, situa oh my goodness, situations at the establishment. Right? So, what are some examples of imminent health hazards? Right? We are talking about talking about smoke, right, due to a fire, due to potentially a fire, not necessarily, right, but the, the, the dining area is filled with smoke that could potentially uh, set you up for an imminent uh, health hazard. What we're really looking at is the fact that there is a fire, right, that's really more important because stuff burns all the time, but if we have smoke due to a fire, your best bet is an, uh, to evacuate the establishment. We're talking about raw sewage, right? So the kitchen and, and many different areas of your establishment, specifically the kitchen and the dishwashing area, you'll have drains in, built into the floor. Now, if raw sewage starts coming up out of the drain where stuff is supposed to be going down, you have an imminent health hazard. So what does that mean? You have the probability that somebody will become sick or will die because this is now airborne. Okay. Um, what else? Raw sewage. So there's a, there's a, this is the big one, right? So let's go, let's stick with this for a second. Let's say there is raw sewage coming up and you do close the establishment, right? Who can reopen you? The only person qualified or the only agency qualified to reopen you is the local health department. Right? That is it. They're the only ones that can come back and give you a you're good to go bill of health. Right? Obviously, you're going to want, you, you need to follow the procedure of cleaning and sanitizing and removing that clog that is causing the raw sewage, right? Another imminent health hazard is a blackout, right? The lights go out. Um, that's it. I mean, if you stop using your refrigerator, you're going to get a good six, eight hours if you don't use that, that cooler anymore. Right? But if you, you have a blackout and you decide, oh, how romantic, 
you know what, my phone has, um, has a credit card app. We don't really need it. Let's set up candles, right? <laughs> you, and now you're not maintaining hot foods hot, cold foods cold. Um, it sounds silly, but it happens. They set up candles. It's a busy night. Let's not close. You have to close the, the restaurant down. You have to close the establishment down. So a blackout is another, another imminent health hazard. So again, oh, loss of refrigeration, right? Speaking of, loss of refrigeration, right? Your refrigerators conk out. I had that happen to me in the ice cream shop. We had a total of seven freezers. I'm helping out my, I had one, one kid working, I had an employee there. I lean up against the freezer to take an order, and I'm like, ooh. This is unusually cool to the touch. On the outside, those freezers are actually warm to the touch because they're working. So the outside is warm and the inside is hot. So I lean up against the freezer to take the order and I'm like, ooh, this is odd, this is cool. When I, I get a little taster spoon, by the way, taster spoon, right? You got that? You taste and you throw it away. So I get a taster spoon and it's, it's starting to melt and I'm like, oh, oh, right? And I see that it looks a little and I've been there that, that afternoon. So immediately I, I let my, my, my employee take care of it. I put everything in another cooler. I shuffle merchandise around so that that's it. This, this freezer is out of commission. It is dead. Um, worst yet would have been had that happened overnight. I would have had this big sloshy mess of, of ice cream. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that when I when to combine those flavors, I had to make sure I wasn't combining those, that product with, da- with non-dairy product, right? Because I used to sell um, Italian ices and ice cream. So I had to make sure that I wasn't mis- mi- mixing the um, dairy with non-dairy and also peanut or nut product with product that isn't nut product, right? Because I had everything segregated as, as, a, as a preventative measure again uh, to save uh, save lives, right? If somebody has an allergen, I was keeping everything segregated, the dairy, the non-dairy, peanut, and, and etc. So imminent health hazard is anything that takes place where literally is imminent that somebody could get hurt. Loss of refrigeration can also be due to a blackout or a broken unit. Now, if I have loss of refrigeration, can I go to a... Um, a home improvement superstore without getting the name of anybody, right? Can I go to a home improvement superstore and pick up a residential unit for my commercial establishment? Can I do that? And the answer is, in case you don't know it, the answer is no, right? I need commercial equipment in my restaurant. I'm not supposed to have residential equipment at the restaurant. Okay, so think about those things. Um, Oh, another imminent health hazard is, I'm going to put this here because this is the only, these are the only folks that can reopen you with certain issues. Um, Oh, um, oh, loss of water. So let's say water stops flowing, right? I need to close because I can no longer flush toilets, wash dishes, perhaps cook. So either loss of water or contaminated water, right? Due to a backflow. And we talked about backflow in another segment, right? So that's when um, you end up with a cross connection. So, um, doo-doo, contaminated. Let me get rid of that. Oh, that's awful. I'm just trying to write on an angle here. Doo-doo, contaminated water. And we talked about that the reason for that contaminated water is a little refresher to you was because of backflow. Um, I'm sorry, I already wrote backflow. Because of, um, um, oh my gosh, I had a brain fart. 
Boop, 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 boop. Back flow. Well, whatever I was going to write, you remember it. Oh my gosh. Um, due to a contaminated, due to back flow. So basically, the, the water source becomes contaminated. Oh, cross connection. That was it. Thank you for reminding me, guys. I heard you call it out there. Thank you. Ooh, ooh. Cross connection. I, I got your, I got it. Thank you for that. Due to a cross connection. So the cross connection was when you left the hose in a bucket unattended, you walked away and there was a drop in water pressure and instead of letting water out, now it was sucking water in. So these are a few of the examples where situations at the establishment are, are called imminent health hazards. With some of these, only the local health department can reopen you, all right? So please bear that in mind. Um, Imminent means somebody is likely to become ill or contaminated. All right, perfect. I want to revisit the three compartment sink and I want to talk to you about three chemicals that are used in the industry, right? If you're not using hot water to wash and or sanitize, I wanted to give you uh, three. Two of them actually um, have a value, one doesn't. And I'm going to put them in alphabetical order, and you know why. Because Mr. Pooch is a little OCD, but that's all right. It'll help you out too, right? I know I'm not the only one out there. So chlorine, right? I'll give you the value for that in a second. We have iodine. Give you the value for that in a second. And then the short name, we have quats. I'm going to go more into detail on this in another segment. You know what? Let me point you to the right page at it just in case you want to get a jump start on it. Why not? Whoops, there it goes. Uh, okay, it's actually on page 25. So I'm going to put it over here. So if you look at page 25 of your study guide, is it up on the screen? Yeah. If you look at page 25, you're also going to see um, water temperatures, right? And you're also going to be directed to something called, and let me put it in a different color so that it stands out. Bye-bye marker. How many times have they fallen? Have you kept track? I say a lot, a lot of times. So we're talking about, and again, I'm, on, I'm looking at page 25. We're talking about water pH, and we are talking about water hardness, right? So when we say water hardness, I'm not referring to ice, right? I'm not referring to ice water. Um, so that's what you want to keep in mind. So now let me give you the values, the short end of it. Um, did I put chlorine up there? I did. All right, perfect. All right, awesome. So. Um, chlorine, chlorine, you know what, let me, let me keep it, yeah, let me use black, all right, all right, chlorine, the values for chlorine are uh, 51 to 99, it's your best bet, right, your values for iodine, you're looking at 12 and a half to 25, and for quats, it's actually per manufacturer. So what are these values? 12 and a half to 25, 51 to 99. I'm going to erase the page number because I need the space. But what we're referring to here with these numbers, if you remember from another module, we were talking about PPM, which is short for parts per million, right? parts per million. So how did you get that information? You got it from a test kit or a concentration uh, kit. Either, either, either name is correct, but a test kit is going to give you that. Now over here I had water pH and water hardness. What is that referring to? Um, not everywhere in the country has city water. Not everywhere in the state has city water. Not everywhere in the state has a sewer system. Right? Um, so what we're talking about here is, is well water. 
right? Whoops, I put it too close. And I actually want to do this, well water. So some of you may not even know what I'm referring to there either. So what this has to do is literally, um, you have a, a house, right? And the water is coming to the home from a pump that goes deep into the ground and then holds water up and feeds it to your house. Okay, so when you have well water, you have minerals, you have sediment, or you have whatever is going on in well water, but your pH water is going to be different, your water hardness is going to be different, and that's what we're referring to here um, with respect to water pH and water hardness. So whenever there's well water, and you know if you have, have well water, because your white laundry gets a little tinged, it's a little yellow, or you see the sprinklers when they hit the walls or cars that they get a little yellow. Um, so it's either well water for the sprinklers. Also, for sprinklers, what they use is what they call reclaimed water. So here's another thing. So I'm going to erase this because I want to give you some verbiage uh, that's going to be critical for you. For some of you, you may not know it and others may know it. Wherever you are, it's okay. I'm here to teach you anyway. So with respect to the type of water we use, we want to use potable, potable water is good, right? That's what we want to use. What we don't want to use, <laughs> you saw that? These markers just, ah, keep falling, right? This is bad water, right? Non-potable or reclaimed water, right? Now, both of them are bad, right? They're not good to make ice cubes. They're not good for drinking. They're not good for cooking. They're not good for washing your hands. They're not good for taking a shower. They're good for watering your lawn, right? Um, those it, that's it, right? So potable water is is your, your go-to. It's safe water. So what is it good for? It's good for everything food safety. Right? Everything food safety. So we talked about ice, drinking, yada, 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 washing dishes, washing your hands. Everything food safety. That is where you have the potable, non-potable water situations. All right? Um... Boom. So pH water. So well, now let's go back for a second. So then pH water, and I'll write it down in case you've muted me. Right? So pH water, what's the problem with it? pH water is less effective. Right? So then you need to look at am I on a city well city water or well water? Because if it's pH, if the pH is not where it needs to be, then I need to change my concentration for my chlorine, iodine, and or quats. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that's it. Let's leave it there for now. I think that's got a good chunk of meat. And come back. We're going to do video segment number 10 next. Thank you so much. Be tuned. Be safe. Love you. Bye-bye.